thought I got you all out And even with new skin and a different life You get under, you get in And every bullet that came with an edge of life Was it the flame you tried to kill? on me even still, 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 still and I'm afraid they always will
be your host tonight and I am super excited to learn more about the marine ecosystems in Antarctica. Before we get started we've got a couple of announcements. Uh, first one is OMSI is committed to sparking curiosity and igniting imaginations if you didn't know. We're all, we're all about that and we want to help you all out at home so we've crafted and curated all sorts of engaging science activities and experiments to inspire you to experience the wonder of science from wherever you are. Visit omsi.edu for more information and resources. And if you do any of our at-home science activities, please send us photos or videos to show us how what wonderful scientists y'all are. I hope you enjoyed tonight's pre-pub trivia and music by Stephanie, Stephanie Schneiderman. She'll be performing live at a Kensal concert in Omsi's Planetarium sometime this fall. Putting on these live shows takes a lot of work and we have an amazing partner that helps us make this happen. So a big thanks and shout out to Stella Stream for providing the live streaming services for tonight's Science Pub. We really appreciate their support. And we are happy to announce that we would like to welcome you back into the museum. We have our body worlds and the cycle of life uh, 
exhibit and also you can tour the USS Blueback submarine. Advanced tickets are required for this because the health and safety of OMSI guests and staff is our utmost priority and we want you to feel comfortable and safe while at OMSI. To meet state guidelines and help limit the spread of COVID-19, OMSI has implemented some changes throughout the museum. Please visit omsi.edu for more information. Also, even though we have science pubs at home, uh, we would like to help y'all put the pub back in science pub and support your local community. So we have some wonderful food and beverage partners that I would encourage you to check out and order some delicious food or drink to go from any of these folks all over the state. This is what it will look like tonight for our science pub program. It'll be uh, pretty similar to our in-person science pubs. Uh, first, we will start with an Antarctica themed trivia game. That'll be a warm up for tonight's talk. So get ready for that. Get your quarantine together so you can compete. And then after trivia, we'll have a lecture by Paul North. After the lecture, we'll have 30 minutes of question and answer. And for the Q&A, you could submit your questions at any point during the lecture via the comments in our live feed. And then we'll collect all of your questions throughout the lecture and afterwards, I'll ask them to the speaker. If you enjoyed tonight's lecture, please consider making a donation or purchasing a Science Pub pint glass. We'll post the link in the comment section for more information. You can see those pub glasses here. There's a picture, they're pretty cute. Um, and we appreciate any donations. If you, let's see, where am I? Oh yeah, and there's no pressure to donate. Our mission at OMSI is to inspire curiosity by creating engaging science learning experiences for people of all ages and backgrounds. So sit back, relax, and get ready for a great lecture right after you win trivia against whoever you're playing against. Um, this week, I would like to welcome on our Coastal Discovery Center manager, Ann Armstrong, to play trivia with me and um, along with all of y'all at home. Hey, Ann, how are you? Doing well, Rebecca. Thanks for having me here. Yeah. Is there anything in particular you're really excited to learn about with tonight's show? Uh, oh, all the, you know, I saw a lot of animals in the advertisements and you, know, you gotta love the animals. Oof, yeah, we can learn more about all the, the animals that live down in Antarctica and why we should not kill them with climate change. <laughs> um, so we are going to get started with trivia. If you are at home, feel free to shout out the answers or you can make some like flashcards to hold up. Um, for You can also try to make it a little bit interesting, uh, play for bragging rights. You can play for who has to chores. You can play for my very favorite prize, which I'll be bestowing upon Anne, which is the prize of many claps. Um, it's free for all, so that's always a great prize. There will be 10 multiple choice questions, and I'll read out the question, and I'll give you time to guess, and then I'll reveal the answer to each question before I move on to the next one. So, Anne, are you ready? I am ready. I'm ready to go. Oof, cool. Oh, you got a whiteboard there? Nice. I am in education. I carry whiteboards everywhere. I love it. I'm here for it. Okay, so question number one. What percentage of Earth's fresh water is frozen in the ice of Antarctica? Is it about 40%, about 50%, about 60%, or about 70%? Okay, I know it's a lot. Definitely a lot. It's a continent. It's covered by an ice sheet. I'm, I'm going to go I'm gonna go big as possible. Go um, big? Yeah, 70%. Yeah, you are right. Good job. Antarctica do about 70% of the planet's freshwater and 90% of the planet's freshwater ice, which is crazy. Um, sometimes I feel like I forget how different the Arctic versus the Antarctic is in terms of size and mass. Yeah, you, know, you think about like Greenland and Antarctica having those ice sheets, but then like all the other ice is still a lot, but not as much as Antarctica is huge. It really is. <laughs> yeah, I haven't been there, but it, the maps tell me it's very large. I hear tell. <laughs> okay, question number two. What is the name of the recent marine protected area that was established in Antarctica? Was it, is it called the Ross Sea, the Antarctic Peninsula, the Weddell Sea, or the Ramsar site? Um, I feel like I've, I've heard of... Ross Sea and the Antarctic Peninsula and the Weddell Sea. So I'm, I'm going to go with the one that I haven't heard of, and I'm just going to, I'm going to stay with D, Ramsar site. That doesn't sound familiar to me at all, so that's why I think it's new. Yeah, and you know, I had only heard of one of these. 
um, because there's the, I think it's the biggest research station is named after this place. And so it is, it's actually the Ross Sea. Okay. You, that was a good, I liked your um, thinking though. There's like the Ross Island shelf out there. So yeah. Yeah. Those, those, um, keep going with that deduction. So yeah, on October 27th, 2016, the world's largest marine preserve was created off Antarctica. It's 598,000 square miles of protected area. It's more than twice the size of Texas and will protect all those sweet little animals like penguins and whales, leopard seals, shamus. So that's pretty exciting. Don't forget the invertebrates. I know I really shouldn't forget the invertebrates. All the little plankton, some diatoms. Yeah. Are there shrimps down there? Maybe some shrimps. There's got to be some crustaceans, you know, something. <laughs> um, which bird species do penguins get their name from? Is it the great auk, the common mirror? I don't know if I'm saying these right, by the way. Petrels or puffins? Well, you know, I'm, I'm in Newport and we have common mirrors and puffins around and they are awesome birds. I love watching the mirrors fly. Um, and I know there are petrels in Antarctica, but I think they're a different thing. So I'm going to go with the great auk. I, say, I think this is the situation where like the scientists see a bird and they're like, that looks like this other bird I know. I'm just going to call it the same name, even though yeah. the world. Thanks, scientists. You are right. <laughs> it is after the great auk. Um, the word penguin first appears in the 16th century as a synonym for great auk. When European explorers discovered what are today known as penguins in the southern hemisphere, they thought they looked similar to these birds in the northern hemisphere and just gave them the same kind of name, even though they're not related. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I should yell at explorers, not scientists in this case. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, you're doing great so far. Are you ready <laughs> One. Yeah, sorry. I'm just like um, common mirrors are awesome. If you're ever in Newport, they're like they they flap their wings so hard because they swim really well, but it's so hard to fly. So they flap their wings so hard, and they are really fun to watch. Oh, that's great! I should keep my eyes out for them next time I'm down there. Yeah, they're really committed to it. <laughs> Almost as committed as you are to winning this trivia. <laughs> hey, I want the I want the hand claps. <laughs> <laughs> it's a coveted, coveted pride. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, what temperature does salt water generally freeze? Is it A, at 22.2 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 5.4 Celsius? At 26.4 Fahrenheit or negative 3.1 Celsius? At 28.2 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 1.8 degrees Celsius? Or at the same as fresh water, which is 32 degrees Celsius, zero degree, or sorry, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees Celsius. All right. Well, I, I knew this anyway, but since you were already like kind of like the same as fresh water indicating that might not be the right answer, I was going to skip D anyway. Um, but I, I think it's, um, you know, uh, no, ice has some really interesting, water has some really interesting properties once it gets to like zero, one, you know, um, really, really down to zero Celsius. Uh, so I'm actually going to go, I'm going to go for A again. Um, I think a that's for like, so it's a real big, a big difference between fresh water and salt water is what you're saying? I think it's a big difference. Yep. It is not as big <laughs> as you would think. <laughs> But it is different because all that salt in there stops the water from freezing at the same temperatures. So it's actually just a little bit colder at 28.2 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 1.8 Celsius. I think if it was a lot further down, we just wouldn't have any ice around. Well, I know it can, you know, water can be still liquid at four degrees and negative four degrees. Um, wow. Yeah, like cool. super super cold ice and there's, you know, I've, I've read stuff about, you know, in glaciers and, you know, and the ice dams that, you know, with the Brett floods and Missoula floods. And there was like, so that was, you know, when you like know too much and you overthink it, that's, I think where I was at. Yeah. That's a really cool fact though. If it like super cold, it just doesn't freeze. It kind of chills as, as water, even though it's so cold. Yeah. Especially if it's very pure and it doesn't have a molecule to go ahead and start that crystallization. Awesome. Hey, fun facts for man. Thanks. You, you must be an educator. 
<laughs> okay, we're almost halfway through. Question number five. What animal is known to be the most dangerous predator of penguins? Is it leopard seals, sea lions, sharks, or killer whales? I, I don't know why I know this, but I'm almost positive. I'm re- I feel very confident that it's leopard seals. But, and I, I don't know yeah. why I know that. You know, I feel like they're very photogenic and I feel like I've seen this in planet Earth as well. I was pretty- Maybe, yeah. Yeah, it is leopard seals. They're one of the main predators of penguins and can attack them both in and out of the water. It must have absorbed that in some thousands of nature documentaries I've watched, but I don't have like a clear memory of learning it. <laughs> awesome. Well, that latent knowledge is there. Uh, <laughs> okay, number six. Ooh, this one's true or false, so got a good chance. After a great decline in their population from the whaling era in the Southern Ocean, blue whales are now successfully able to breed with fin whales. So do you think it's true or false that blue whales are able to breed with fin whales these days? That seems weird. Um, It does seem weird, but why else would this fact exist if it was? (laughs) Because it's a question. It's not a fact. The question question (laughs) exists. Why would they write this question in this way? It sounded so weird if it was false. (laughs) You know, if it was like a different whale than blue whales, then I would, I'm going to say false. I just feel like fin whales and blue whales are too different. I don't know. I mean, they're both baleen whales. They're both big whales, but. um, They are very different, but this, I think this question maybe is leading towards something that we'll see in our. um, Is that what I'm supposed to do? (laughs) Something in our, in the lecture later. This Uh one. There's no little explanation on this one, but hopefully we'll hear more about it during the lecture because that's all. Look forward to that. It's like ocean ligers. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Next one. What percentage of Antarctica is covered by ice? So there's some kind of continent in there. Yeah. Covered by Um, ice. Twenty-eight percent, fifty-five percent, seventy-nine percent, or ninety-nine percent. Um, oh, I don't know. I mean, there, there definitely are areas that don't have ice. Um, and, you know, it's really hard, you know, you look at the map and so much of it is sea ice as well. It's hard to know, like, what is it land versus sea ice. So, um, I'm just going to go big again. I'm going to go 90, you know, I'm just going to go for all the extremes, uh, 99%. I like the way you think, because um, this world is the world of extremes. Yeah, uh, the ice sheet is the largest single mass of ice on Earth. Percent. That's crazy. Okay, we're in the home stretch, and it's another true or false. Does Antarctica have an active volcano? Um, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> We cannot do underwater volcanoes that, you know, count? Maybe, you know. Oh, I don't know. That's a great question. I feel like I often forget about those underwater volcanoes. I, I do a lot of tectonic plates and, you know, earthquake stuff out here. So I think a lot about underwater volcanoes. That's probably not what this question is. Um, I think it's going to be a cool fact if it's true. And so I'm going to say true. It is true. Home to Mount... Erebus. I don't know if I said that right. Uh, it's the southernmost active volcano on the planet and home to Earth's only long-lived lava lakes. Well, I know nothing about that. That is very cool. That is really cool. I didn't know. Hey, we're learning so much. Okay, <laughs> almost done. How many countries operate research stations on Antarctica? 10, 15, 25, or 30? <sighs> I know a lot of, there's a lot of stations on Antarctica for sure. Um, But also it's a lot of money to go ahead and start a research station. Um, I will go with, uh, I'll go with B, 15. Kind of split the difference. Yeah. 30. So I think maybe it's that they send personnel to the research stations. Let's see. Seven nations have made a claim in Antarctica, but about 30 of these countries have signed the Antarctic Treaty to send personnel to research stations on the Antarctic continent and the Antarctic Peninsula. All told, there's as many as 
45 year-round stations and 30 summer stations. Hmm. It's a okay, lot of research going on down there. Yeah, and there, I think there's some nuance in there, too, of, like, you know, who owns the station. You know, everything I read about Antarctica is um, they definitely do, like, a lot of collaboration and different stations have different specialties. Um, mm-hmm. um, yeah, there's some nuance in that question. I'm not sure I picked up, but all right, I'll go with it. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm with you, too, but we can still be amazed by this next wonderful fact and, just and, the, and the point is, like, it's an international operation, which is what's really important. Yeah, I've had some friends who worked at the research stations like as cooks and cleaners and stuff mm-hmm. because there's jobs down there other than research so fun fact for y'all at home if you're not yeah. a science researcher and you want to go to antarctica for a job there's jobs down there yeah every job yeah somebody's got to be a plumber All the somebody's got to yeah. be a firefighter yeah I, I knew another person who was a driver down there it's so cool mm-hmm. uh, okay final question and final, learn something new before we learn a whole lot more new things in the lecture <laughs> section. <laughs> um, who, I have no idea about any of this. I don't know if you do. Who was the first polar explorer to successfully reach the South Pole? Was it Roald Amundsen, Robert Falcon Scott, John Franklin, or Ernest Shackleton? I, um, I, I'm pretty sure... Uh, it was, it's A, and I think he's a Norwegian explorer. Norwegian explorer. You're right. Good job. Uh, Norwegian explorer Roald Abenson was the first human to reach the South Pole. He beat out English explorer Robert Falcon Scott by arriving on December 14th, 1911 and planted that Norwegian flag. Uh, Congrats, Anne. You won trivia, the prize with many claps. How do you feel? Do you feel successful? I I feel successful. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm all pumped and ready to learn more. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. Thank you so much for joining us today and doing trivia and giving so many extra fun facts. Uh, (laughs) Have fun out there in Newport and I'll see you later. Sounds good. Thanks, Rebecca. Bye. Bye. Okay, everyone, it's time to introduce our speaker. Paul North is the founder of Meet the Ocean, which is a Portland-based nonprofit that uses storytelling and interactive technology to advocate for Earth's marine ecosystems. He produces online media and outreach campaigns to encourage public awareness and visit schools and children's hospitals internationally to present content from Antarctica and other far-off destinations. So, Paul, are you almost ready to join me? I sure am, yes. Uh, One second here. I'm super excited for your talk today. That trivia was awesome. We we had a lot of great facts in that trivia. Uh, Yeah, and uh, happy to address some of those finer points. So, uh, but well done to everyone attempting to answer such difficult questions at home. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here and take it away. Can do. Thank you, everyone, for joining me, and thank you to OMSI for continuing not only to educate our city of Portland, Oregon, uh, but the world here virtually with the Science Pub. Uh, as you have heard, my name is Paul North, and I am the nonprofit director of Meet the Ocean, which is essentially an educational nonprofit that is set up to improve science communication and use creativity when it comes to conservation efforts to try and better access the public's attention and create more advocates for Earth's ecosystems. Uh, Today, oh, hold on a second. There we go. Um, Today, I will be taking you to a faraway place uh, to shed some light on somewhere that I think is very far away from our imagination. And that is because we just don't interact with it. But when we look at human history, when we look at someone even as famous as, say, Aristotle, before humanity even knew that Antarctica existed, there was some thought that somewhere there must be some balance at the bottom of our planet. And surely there is. There is this large continent that is surrounded by the Southern Ocean, which you can kind of see in the gray outline of this place. Now, I would greatly argue that Antarctica is not a place that can be summarized 
But what I will do tonight is try and dig as deeply as possible in an overview of the ecosystem there from the small stuff that is likely the most important stuff all the way up to the larger creatures that we are used to seeing, uh, the whales, the seals, and of course, uh, the penguins. And I would say that Antarctica has a bit of a mythology wrapped around it. And of course, that mythology is entrenched in the ice, the ice that we learned about in our trivia and the ice that we often hear about in the news. Now, this is photographically amazing. It's aesthetically pleasing. Hard to get a sense of the size, even though this particular piece of ice is about the size of a city block or for the PDX folk, about as large as Powell's bookstore. And we know that the ice is there. And we also know that the penguins are there because they strike an emotional reaction with us. We think that they are cute and to our eyes, to our sensibilities, they are, but we have to start thinking about these interactions. How do the penguins live? How do they interact with the ice seasonally? How does that ice inform the ecosystem? So all of these questions I'll try and shed some light on this evening. And perhaps the first question is, how do I even have access to a place like Antarctica? And that is for who I work for. And that is Lindblad Expeditions and National Geographic. Essentially, we are those who take you there. You are viewing the National Geographic Explorer, by no means a cruise ship. This is a ship that is built for expedition travel. Small numbers, highlighted interactions with as many uh, species as we can find. And that's the beauty of it. You never know what you're going to find unless you go to Antarctica, because there is going to be certain species that you know you're going to see, but we go all over the place, places around the world that really boggle the mind. And in doing so, we are able to make connections with nature that I just don't think are available to many. And because of that, because of the access to these places, it becomes important to not only experience them as an individual, but to share them in a meaningful way with the public. And this is a question that I had to ask myself, which is how to do this, how best to represent the blue. There are plenty of organizations that are set up to focus on one species, and that is necessary because all species need focus attention and protection, but I chose a wider angle, a larger net perhaps. I chose to speak to the ocean as a whole because it is the ocean that I interact with. Working with Limblad Expeditions and National Geographic, my job title is an undersea specialist. And what that means is I go underwater while guests are out on their zodiacs or perhaps hiking on land. And my job is to represent the ecosystem that are down below. And I spend a great deal of my time down in Antarctica and in the polar regions, but Antarctica, I would say, has become a specialty of mine as I have been diving there for over five years. Now, when you go underwater, you start to notice certain patterns and going around the world, I would say that I have learned that color is one of the most effective communicators, not only human to human, because we are dazzled by what the ocean is able to achieve. But I would say that color itself is actually one of the largest forms of communication on our planet. And of course, sometimes it's just about introducing people to something they've never seen before, something strange, and then you can start to tell its story. And I would say that that is who I am at my essence, which is a storyteller, because I don't have a science background. I have a creative writing, a theater and film background, but having over 2000 dives under my belt has helped me to tell the ocean story. And in doing so, I have learned much, so much in fact that I had to do something with it. When I got off ship, it became something that literally kept me up at night because I, I simply felt that the story could be improved, that science communication itself could be improved. So I ended up starting Meet the Ocean, a nonprofit that is very strong in its media output. We're very creative. We try and gain the audience's attention. And one of the primary ways in which we do so is via a podcast. 
Now, many of you know that the whole podcast movement is growing, and I think this is because people are recognizing the power of storytelling more so than ever before, because there's plenty of media being thrown our way, but where is the meaning? And what actually sticks? What are we able to retain? Well, it turns out that storytelling has always been, and I would claim will always be, the most effective means at communicating dense packets of information, specifically from faraway places. And in doing so, we have opened doors. Our very first episode was Ian and the Albatross. And as you can see uh, with this Albatross on the microphone, we are trying to speak for the species that can't speak for themselves. And in doing so, we come across some legendary figures, National Geographic photographers like Jay Dickman, or legends like David Sibley, who represents the natural world with his art. Authors like Dr. Carl Safina, who writes on the emotional impact of the, the animal experience. You know, we completely often disregard what it is to live as an animal uh, because it seems that we have forgotten that we are animals ourselves. And these opinions and these stories are quite important and quite effective, especially when you hear them from the younger generation. Often we talk about speaking to the younger generations, but it's also important to hear their voices. So we go there, but we also don't shy away from the more difficult topics like extinction. The small cetacean that you're seeing on your screen here is a vaquita. If you've never heard of this creature, it's because it's endemic to the Sea of Cortez down in Mexico, and it lives in a very small area and is under great threat. We may not even see them in the year 2021 at this point, but these are stories, again, that might never reach the public unless someone makes the effort to tell them. And in telling them, we have reached across the world. Our podcast has been downloaded in over 80 countries. And I am happy to say that just this week, or last week, I should say, uh, we were voted by the Willamette Week, Portland's local art and culture uh, newspaper, that we were the best nature podcast. So this is all very exciting. We are about to drop our 75th episode, so please tune in. But of course, today, the story we are telling is of the Southern Ocean, of Antarctica itself. This is a bit of biogeography presented by an artist friend of mine, Ian Bullock. And this is the most traveled route that I do down in Antarctica. We often shoot over to the Falkland Islands before heading to South Georgia, which is the northern tip of the Southern Ocean, before heading down to the peninsula itself, which you're seeing at the bottom left of your screen. And just take a look at this overview of the amount of species that inhabit these waters and think of what the Southern Ocean is, the coldest ocean on our planet, the saltiest ocean on our planet. And because of that temperature barrier, it sort of is its own ecosystem and a fascinating one at that. And yes, there is that majestic ice that have you, you have heard about and, you know, that, that would rival the skyscrapers that are in the downtown of our city. Uh, but this ice is dynamic. It is never not changing. And sometimes you see explosions and dynamic moments like glacier calving. And it's hard to even achieve perspective here because what we're seeing is a piece of ice that's over 200 feet tall shedding pieces of ice that are larger than the ship that we witnessed them from. So this is all very impressive. But what is more impressive is the sea ice. The sea ice, which we don't often consider uh, because it's just not as dramatic as the glacier ice. But the sea ice is where the entirety of the ecosystem begins. Because the sunlight is powerful enough to pierce through the ice and still de deliver enough of its energy to create photosynthesis. And photosynthesis via the phytoplankton is where the story of Antarctica truly begins. Yes, that's a nice piece of ice, but take a look at the green that's in the water. Now, as a diver, this is terrible. I can't see anything and it's very difficult to take a photograph, but from a ecosystem perspective, this is exactly what is needed to kick off all that will happen throughout the various trophic levels of the Antarctic ecosystem. And it does begin with the diatom, single-celled algae, very small, a smudge on your finger that would appear nothing. You might not even see it, but yet 
via mitosis. These creatures just expand in a way that just allow for more photosynthesis than I think we have the imagination to sort of really capture at times because we often forget the, ma the majority of oxygen on our planet comes from marine photosynthesis. Now, phytoplankton are fascinating because they take on all shapes and sizes. They use whatever is dissolved in the water column to become what they are. Sometimes it's calcium carbonate that they're using, essentially chalk. But down in the Southern Ocean, a lot of it is silica, which is essentially glass. So these phytoplankton, these single-celled algae, are building their, their structures and able to photosynthesize in a way that makes Antarctica what it is. And if you have leaned in on any Antarctic information at any time in your life, you have probably come across this small crustacean. In the trivia, there was a question about whether or not there's shrimp down in Antarctica. There certainly are in that typical bottom of the ocean floor way, but it is these krill, Euphasia superba, the largest krill species on our planet, and really the rock stars, you don't get superba as uh, a name unless you are of a certain notoriety. And these are the largest krill on our planet. And these are the keystone species of Antarctica. There are few things that exist in the Southern Ocean that do not interact with krill in some way. But krill rely on that sea ice that we saw because a good year of sea ice is a good year for krill. Essentially, they are farmers. They are scraping the algae on the bottom side of the sea ice, which provides them protection. It provides them nourishment, and it allows them to get big enough to then be a protein source for the rest of the Antarctic ecosystem. Now, just for a, a sense of their biomass, if you took every human on planet Earth and you put them on a scale, added that number up, there are more krill Per, as weight than there are humans on planet Earth. That is the immensity of their biomass. It is something that even scientists have difficulty tracking. And when fishing actually happens down in Antarctica, they base their quota on the best science available. Because simply, the Southern Ocean is so large that we must estimate to say how much food is and is not there. And as you can assume, this will and already has turned into a political issue. But there is a counterpart to the krill. I said a good year of sea ice is a good year for krill. What is a bad year of sea ice? What does that mean for the krill if the sea ice is breaking and they don't have that protection and that known food source? Well, then these guys take over. These big, uh, well, big on this photo, they're actually quite small, but this is a colonial tunicate. It's known as a salp. And they are chained together in, in chains that I have seen grow 20 feet long or more. And I have swam through a minefield of these in Antarctica, which alerts me to the fact that the year before was not a good year for sea ice. And these are the fastest growing organisms in Antarctica, and they are direct competitors with krill. So they will eat that same food source. But the problem is, is that they don't have the same nourishment as a krill will to uh, other species. So they are literally sort of cutting off krill from the rest of the food chain when the sea ice doesn't do what it has for so many thousands of years. Now, you may have noticed a little hitchhiker on these salps, someone taking a ride, a free ride. And that's great because the less energy that this creature spends, uh, the more success it will have to grow and to reproduce. And what you're seeing here is an amphipod. I point it out because this is kind of the where's Waldo of Antarctica, meaning that every photograph I take seems to have an amphipod in it at some point, even if I don't notice it until I'm processing my photography later. And if you think I'm joking, just look at how many of these creatures are scuttling along the bottom. These are the scavengers. They're taking all that dead organic matter that is literally raining down from the upper water column and making it a meal. And here again, a close up on a sea star, and yet we find another amphipod. So these are uh, my most frequent friends. 
when I am diving down there. And in terms of friends, there are large and small to find. And when you really look, you start to see them. This small snail, which I would say is about the size of my pinky nail, is scurrying along this very flimsy form of algal growth, but it grows fast. And in an environment where there's constantly ice coming on by via the ocean current, it can act as a bulldozer. So an ecosystem can get wiped out by glacier ice being dragged by the ocean current. And that leaves behind a barren field, which this quick growing algae and various snails and other organisms will take advantage of as quickly as possible. You might be surprised to see kelp like this in the Southern Ocean, but this is in South Georgia, reminiscent of the kelp that we see off of the West Coast of North America, but still absolutely fascinating because it is food, it is habitat, and so many other things. It literally defines the ecosystem. It allows things to live there all while photosynthesizing and providing us and so many other creatures with oxygen. Like I said, kelp does become a home and some creatures will dig in that home for the entirety of their lives. This is a giant isopod, a thing perhaps of nightmares given how sharp you see uh, its legs are. And those legs are not set up for long walks on the beach. They are there for ripping and for tearing. So these little isopods, or not so little because their name is giants, uh, are very happy when they find some sort of uh, you know, dead anything because that can become a meal for days. And uh, these are constant friends down on the bottom. But again, that story of kelp, what is happening in it? What lives on it? Another frequent star of the Antarctic show are limpets. Now, limpets are very unassuming snails. They have a triangular shape to their shell, which allows them to exist on high energy beaches, often in the intertidal zone. But in Antarctica, there really isn't an intertidal zone because anything that is exposed to the temperature of the air will likely freeze to death. So most all of the action is taking place below the lowest of tides. But still, there are gulls that will dip in and grab hold of these, swallowing them whole and later coughing up the limpet shell. You can see some of its teeth. They're not teeth like we have. It's called a radula, and it's something that every mollusk has. But with limpets, it's actually the strongest substance on planet Earth that an animal produces, even stronger than the silk of silkworms. And all that strength is just set up for licking algae. It's what they do best, and it's what they do for the entirety of their existence. It is a simple life, but it is high functioning and is one that informs the entirety of the Antarctic ecosystem. Anyone who knows the underwater landscape usually is a fan of these. These are nudibranchs, some of my favorite creatures in the ocean, over 3,000 species worldwide, but in Antarctica, they're not as decorous as, say, Indonesia or the Coral Triangle. Uh, this little one is smaller than my pinky, but popping its head up and you can see there with its bunny-like ears, these are not ears at all, but rather chemical sensors known as rhinophores that are feeling out the signals that are around in the water column. It's how they find their food. It's how they find their mates. It's how they live their lives, even in these sub-zero temperatured waters. And I ask myself, how can something this beautiful exist in such a harsh environment? But the truth is, is that nature always finds a way. And it is clear that this creature, this nudibranch, is not hiding. It's not even attempting to. Rather, it's announcing itself. It's saying something very important when it comes to a low light environment like Antarctica. It's saying one thing, I'm disgusting, don't eat me. That's communication, color is communicating that to the variety of creatures that have learned that these creatures are not on the menu. They are decorous, they are beautiful, and they exist throughout the Southern Ocean. Now, a question I often get is, where are all the fish? Where are all the fish? Fish are one of the first things our mind go to when we think about salt water. 
And Antarctica has plenty of them. Most of them don't exist in the shallows, but some of them do. This fish is, could fit in the palm of my hand, that's how small it is, but this is an Antarctic ice fish, a juvenile, one that is waiting to grow and it will head into deeper waters, far deeper than I can go as a diver, uh, but a fascinating creature that spends its time on the ocean bottom and contains a glycoprotein inside of its blood that essentially acts as antifreeze. It does not allow uh, for its blood to freeze. And when you think about evolutionary adaptation, that is fascinating because any other fish that we pulled from a temperate zone and put it in such an environment, it just would not survive. So these creatures have had to survive in one of the most extreme environments on our planet. In terms of the largest fish that I have ever seen with my own eyes, you are looking at it. This is a screenshot of a video that I took. This has perhaps the best name of any fish on our planet. It is called the crocodile dragon fish. Yes, the crocodile dragon fish. Many creatures smashed into one, into this orange-faced, blue-eyed, majestic creature, which I have only seen twice in the five years that I've been diving down in Antarctica. So a rare encounter. Uh, I never did see its, op uh, its mouth open, very platypus-like bill, but I did hear a story about a scientist diver who was trying to collect some of its eggs and got their hand bitten. And given how large the mouth is, I'm, I'm sure that didn't feel all that good. Now, during our trivia, there was a, a comment about sticking up for the invertebrates. And this is something that I always try and do. I know this looks like something out of a Star Wars movie. Maybe the Millennium Falcon would fly out of it. But all we are looking at are the siphons of a clam. A clam that has sensed a very large mammal with a very large camera heading towards it and has retracted in a way to protect itself. One of these valves takes water in oxygenates the gills, provides food for the stomach. The other one expels the waste out. Again, a very simple but effective system. And simplicity is necessary because every inch of the creature must have some purpose or else its likelihood of surviving is greatly diminished. That is the very story of evolution. And I would say even more extreme in the Southern Ocean itself. Now here's something to help you sleep at night, right? It is a sea spider. Now, not an arachnid like we have on land, even though it resembles it in every way, not only visually uh, because of the amount of legs that it has, but also because it will creep up on a variety of creatures and insert a proboscis and then literally suck the juices out of those creatures. Very spider-like, uh, an adaptation that you know, it never learned from the creatures on the land, but it just shows that the land and the water often replicate certain strategies. Now, in Antarctica, these sea spiders can get about to the size of a typical dinner plate, and that's called ocean gigantism, and that happens in the deeper water. I would say the largest one that I've seen is about the size of my hand. One of the things that it preys on are anemones. Now, down in Antarctica, this species is the largest that I've ever seen. I would say it's about the size of a basketball. And as beautiful, as aesthetic, and perhaps even floral as these creatures are, we have to keep in mind that they are a deadly trap. That anything that comes into contact with them that is small enough, be it a fish, a plankton, or anything that might be susceptible to its poison barbs, it can quickly collapse upon it and make it a meal. And because of this patient strategy, these creatures don't have to expend a lot of energy. And because of that, they are quite long lived. And within that family, within the jellyfish family, right? The Nadarian, those who use stinging cells, stinging barbs, I should say, uh, are these hydroids, which are stalked but essentially have the same strategy as the anemone, as the jellyfish would, except it's just sitting still. And it's relying on surface area to catch what the ocean current will bring it. In terms of a grouping, one of my favorite uh, classifications of creatures are these, the echinoderms. 
you are looking at a close-up of a sea urchin. I know it looks like something out of a horror movie, but keep in mind that all of these small differentiated appendages are moving without the use of a brain. Just take a moment to understand how we have four limbs and the, the ability to move them all using the cognitive resources that we have. But this creature has learned to do so uh, to a multitude without the same sort of cognitive functioning. And I find that to be absolutely fascinating. If you see some of the white bits, this is the very reason why sea urchins and sea stars never have anything growing on them. They're essentially small little feet called pedicellary that have these pincers on them. And in using them, they can literally grab prey and make it a meal or pick any algae or parasite off of them that might encumber you know, their health. Now, echinoderms down in the Southern Ocean are fascinating. Some of them are very large. This sea star with its over 40 arms would probably be about the size of an extra large pizza or slightly bigger. And this is a main predator of the ocean bottom. And when we look up close, again, these tube feet, they are used to grab prey. They are used to move from A to B, but they are also used to breathe through because there is oxygen in the water. It is dissolved. And these creatures have to find a way with which to incorporate it into their form. And sea stars and all echinoderms do that via diffusion, literally transferring the oxygen through the cell wall. They're absorbing it. No lungs. Lungs aren't necessary, but they can do so through their feet, as can the sea spider, as can many other creatures that are in the ocean. And when it comes to Antarctic echinoderms, this one's probably my favorite. You can tell that people spent a long time naming it because it's called the purple sea star. Yes, a very obvious name, but a very functional one too. E even though there are uh, different species of this purple sea star, they are nearly identical. And when you get up close, you again start to realize the purpose of color in the ocean and what symmetry can do, and just how well evolution has created these creatures to function in such a harsh environment. This creature, unbelievably, has been um, known to live more than 100 years. And what you're seeing uh, in the top left is essentially its valve, one that it fills itself up with water. Now, most of the things that I've just showed you do not have a spine. By definition, they are invertebrates. So the question becomes, how do they then maintain their structure? Well, so many of them do so via what is known as hydrostatic inflation. Hydrostatic inflation, hydro meaning water. They are inflating themselves with the water that is around them. And in doing so are able not only to achieve a form, but a function. And this is so fascinating because it is so foreign to how you and I live our lives. It is entirely different, but it also reveals a, a pretty important point. And that is that the ocean has been around longer than the land. Simple to say, perhaps hard to comprehend, but it at least lets us know, it cues us in that the ocean has had more time to evolve, to adapt to create all these creatures with which uh, I'm trying to example to you in this talk. So of course I am in love with all of these invertebrates, their variety, their function, their color, but you cannot dive in Antarctica without encountering some of its history. And its history is rather rich, uh, rich because of the characters and the legends that are involved in it, but rich also because there was a resource down there to extract. What you are looking at is a shallow water dive that I did at a place that is now known as the Penguin Post Office. It's called Port Lockroy. It is a place that you now go in and you celebrate the science that was in a bygone era. It was a research station at one point, but before that it was a whaling station. And now scuttled along the bottom is a history of the bones of the creatures that 
were hunted in order to benefit the society that our grandparents, great grandparents uh, got to enjoy. Before the invention of electricity, it was whale oil that lit the darkness at night. It's how we were able to read. It's not a kind history, uh, but it's not one that we can change now except in how we view these creatures and our interactions with them. Because I have to tell you, to swim amongst this museum is a very complex emotional experience. Not only are you ridiculously cold because you're diving in Antarctica, but you are now amidst, amidst the burial ground and watching not only uh, the immensity of the bones that you're seeing, but how nature has taken hold. You can see a sponge in this image because really anywhere there is something to grab onto in the ocean, be it rock or bone, life will find a way. So the touted history, the Roll Amundsen's and the Robert Falcon Scott's, the Ernest Shackleton, they are the ones that fill the pages of literature, but we have to keep in mind the price that was paid. Now, humpback whales, I am happy to say, have made a great comeback in these waters. Uh, scientific studies have shown population growth uh, to be on an upward climb. But in terms of other species, specifically the blue whale, their numbers will whittle down to about 1% of pre-whaling numbers. And because of that, it is an immense climb to get even the slightest bit of population growth when there are those, that, those few left. How do they even find each other? And, you know, all of these are questions that scientists are asking and hoping for the best results. Now, everything that I've talked about has been in diveable range, either at the surface or maybe 100, 120 feet below it. And that is where most of the life is taking place. But we have to keep in mind that there is a deep ocean. It surrounds our planet, but it certainly surrounds Antarctica. And to be able to explore that, you need to use specific tools. What you're looking at here is known as an ROV, a remote operated vehicle. And this little guy can fit into a Pelican case and go on an airplane and go all around the world. And I like to think of it in a lovingly manner as the very reason that I can look my mother in the eye and say, thanks for letting me play video games all those years because I am good at driving these things now because of the abstract thinking that takes part in when you're holding a controller. But why are we using this? Well, we're using this to explore the deep ocean. And I could spend an entire talk just talking about what's down there. But in the next video, you will see one specific species, an octopus, and it's hunting something that is quite specific, which are krill. Whether it does so successfully, we are about to find out. Uh, you can go ahead. All right, well, what you just saw was an octopus, which are very rare to see uh, on any diving depth in Antarctica, but you were able to see it via an ROV, which is something that we really try and do because often our minds aren't thinking about what is deep down there, but truly the majority of our ocean is at a depth where tons of nutrients are just falling over. Uh, the, the ocean shelf and feeding all sorts of organisms down there. And in the last decade, we have seen more deep ocean exploration than ever before. And as that unfolds in Antarctica, it's going to be super exciting. I could not do a talk about Antarctica without talking about penguins. But instead of detailing 
uh, their lives, I will give a bit of an overview because we have to think of how hard it is to live in these environments, to live in this solitude. No instruction manual on how to raise your family when the wind starts blowing, when the snow starts falling, when the predators lurk. These are Gen 2 penguins, one of three brush tail species. And as you may imagine, it is quite difficult to successfully raise what they often have, which is two chicks. Uh, one is often bigger than the other because it's going to elbow in and make sure that it gets first access to the food. And because of that, the second penguin usually falls to the wayside. Eventually, uh, occasionally, I should say, there are success stories, but it is a game of math and the margins are very narrow. Even to build your nest is a bit of a melee because there is so much rock feeling that happens because rocks are what you build your nest out of when you are a penguin. And as you're scuttling off to grab a new one, you may very well uh, be getting depleted from the nest that you've been working on for days by your neighbors. And things like this, uh, you can understand why a flightless bird might get grumpy, but you know this is the life that they lead. And we view them with so much levity, they cause us to giggle. Uh, they cause us to feel a high emotional state, but we have to keep in mind that these creatures are living their lives and they are doing so under harsh conditions. There is not a penguin scientist that I know that doesn't express just how hard it is for them themselves to live amongst the penguins in the colony as they are researching them, not to mention the birds themselves, the difficulties that they endure. Many of these species that you've seen uh, live about 25 years or so. So not particularly long lived, but when you consider that environment that they are in, that is still a very impressive number. Now the golden, um, uh, the holy grail I should say of penguins are the emperors. And, and it was just last November that I had my most dynamic encounter with them. And of course it was happening on the sea ice, a, a very important function for all life down in Antarctica. Antarctica, but for emperors as well. And these kind of experiences just bowl you over because you are so far away from anything that is familiar to you, for the things that you call important in your life. And in this vastness, in this desolation of ice and wonder, you see these creatures living their lives. And that has an impact in a way that anyone who does see them, I don't think remains the same. If I were to pick a favorite, it would be the king, the second largest, just after the emperors, uh, just because they're so gregarious, because they're so curious, they're so willing to walk right up to you and sometimes uh, to pose next to the leftover skull of a whale and just give a notion about the interaction between these species, not only on the land, but also in the water. Moving on to another group, uh, we shall talk about the seals. Now, many of you, because the way media works, have probably come across these elaborate stories of leopard seals and the carnage which, which they inflict. Now, all of that is true, 100%. Uh, you may have heard things like they grow to be about 12 feet long. That is true. Uh, you may have heard that they eat penguins. That is also true. That jaw that you are seeing is able to open about 120 degrees. But instead of just inflating the monstrous details of this creature, perhaps let's soften it up a bit and say things like it sings in its sleep. It raises its, it, it raises its young just like so many other creatures do. And actually about 60% of its diet is krill. So again, even a creature as notorious as the leopard seal still is relying on the small crustacean that is the keystone species to the entirety of the Antarctic food web. Moving on throughout the seals, we have the Antarctic fur seals with mostly, uh, they are breeding up in South Georgia, which is still in the Southern Ocean, just in the northernmost point. And whereas they are cute as, as pups, essentially, uh, they grow up and become about 400 pounds and during the breeding season, I wouldn't 
suggest getting in the way between the males and the females because things can get quite cantankerous, let us say. Uh, there are elephant seals, a different species than we have here in the Northern Hemisphere. Here you can see a wiener uh, that's coming up, uh, thinking hopefully that I might be a mother instead of just a, a man with a camera in his hand. And these creatures, I think, are some of the most fascinating throughout the world's oceans because of so many things. One, their sexual dimorphism. That's a fancy way to say that the males are much bigger than the females. Uh, as you can see in this picture, they're not too worried about raising the young, more so just creating them. Uh, but as oafy and as sluggish as these creatures might seem on land, they are master divers going down more than a mile and even being able to sleep underwater while moving. They can sleep as they're rising up to the surface. These are evolutionary adaptations that just are humbling because you think about the time that it took for this creature to become what it was. But there is a creature in Antarctica known as the Weddell seal. And if I was being facetious to summarize it, I might call it the Pink Floyd of the Southern Ocean because of the sound that it is able to make sounds that you will hear in this next video. Pretty amazing stuff, as you can hear. We must keep in mind that the ocean is largely not a visual environment. Uh, clearer water, tropics, you're going to have a, a lot more visibility. But when it comes to Antarctica, often the water is cloudy. So what you just heard is the way that these seals have evolved to speak to each other. Now, sometimes that's enough to actually go through the ice itself, which at times can be over six feet thick. So just imagine what it is able to do with these vocalizations and then ask yourself, what are they actually saying? Are they asking to meet up? Are they communicating about a food source that was recently discovered? These are the nuanced questions that scientists are now looking into. And the last of our Antarctic seals, at least the ones that I personally have a photograph of, uh, there is a creature known as the Ross seal, uh, but because it mainly takes place on the Ross Sea side, which I have yet to go to, I don't have a personal photograph of, but you are looking at the crab eater seal. Now crab eaters is a bit of a misnomer uh, because there aren't really crabs in Antarctica. There are a variety of crustaceans, but most of them are in the shrimp category or the krill themselves. Uh, but it turns out that uh, it's a translation error because uh, the Swedish word for krill is krab. So they are krill eating seals, which they certainly are. Uh, but when you are a seal on a piece of ice, you may very well uh, become a food source for something else. But the question is who? Who would have the ability to be a predator for a, a creature that is this size and has that much mass to it? Well, many of you probably already know the answer, but it is no less uh, amazing to witness because killer whales do live in Antarctica. And not only that, but you are looking at the largest, the largest species of killer whale on our planet. They are known as type A, 
Their dorsal fin, at least on the male, is about six feet tall. That is as tall as myself, this human standing in front of you. And you may imagine that whales of this size are quite intimidating and they are able to hunt basically whatever they fancy down there. But the largest ones, the type A's, are whale specialists. They'll go uh, for minke whales and for other smaller cetaceans teaming up to outthink and overpower them. But when you are close to these creatures and you start to feel their intelligence, when you start to understand the nuance of their hunting strategy, and when you begin to realize that the term killer whale is not enough to define them in Antarctica because there are five different ecotypes, five different ecotypes. And that means that there are five different kinds of killer whales. Now, how is that possible? Well, evolutionary divergence. It's a uh, slight splitting, habitual change, which led to other changes. And because of those five different types, now I've said ecotype and I've said types because scientists are still working to define whether or not these creatures can be defined as their own species. And eventually, I think, obviously, it will come to that, given how different they are, not only physically, but behaviorally. But when you think about the science that is yet to be conducted, we must realize that there is still so much that we have to figure out about everything. And that is why science is so exciting. That is why science communication is so important. Because as one killer whale is going for a seal, perhaps, the others may very well be going for a penguin or maybe diving deep and going for a toothfish. But I must admit that one of the most dynamic nature encounters of my life was this one. And what you're looking at is a type B killer whale. Uh, the B2, uh, the B1s, I should say. There are B1s and B2s. B1s are the ones that are known as pack ice killer whales, wave washing killer whales. Now, if you have yet to hear the term wave wash, then understand that these creatures are able to, in unison, swim together in a way that creates a wave powerful enough to wash these seals off the ice. Now, what is the killer whale doing in this image? Well, it's spy hopping. It's getting a sense of where the seal is on the ice, of the position of the seal, so that when they target it, when they begin to make the movements that will throw the wave, that their accuracy is quite literally deadly. And I was able to witness this just after New Year's um, in the year 2018. And just take in this photo for a second. A couple details. One, four killer whales in the water. The one on the left is a juvenile. So some were theorizing that this was an exercise to teach it how to throw a wave in the first place. Now, typically, killer whales are going to go for Waddell seals. This is a crab eater seal, one that is faster, skinnier, and a little bit more aggressive than a Waddell seal. So on the killer whale menu, this is not the top preference. But when you're in Antarctica, sometimes you must take what is available. And we were able to watch them in, in synchronicity, in, in beautiful, efficient manners, collaborate in order to wash this seal off, not once, but a multitude of times. And just check out this wave, this wave that was created by killer whales swimming in unison. I emphasize this because it is just fantastic, because at it's, it's starkest reality. These creatures are using a tool, a tool. Now, what is a tool? It's something external from our body that we then use to accomplish something. It might be a nail. It might be uh, a hammer, you hitting a nail. It might be a saw, something that we invented, but killer whales don't need to invent anything. They have the water as a resource, but they manipulate it in a way that effectively gains them nourishment, habits that they are able to pass down generation after generation. And I would argue 
one of the most dynamic and fascinating encounters that anyone can witness in the entirety of our planet. This is Antarctica at its most raw. When you were able to witness creatures working together in order to bring a creature of great size like this minke whale down, this was the last breath that this whale took. And I know that many of you might find this to be disheartening, but the truth is, is that killer whales need to eat in the same way that we do. So this exchange is nature. There's nothing horrid about it. There's no malicious intent. It is just how the family gets fed. And I have learned so much uh, from these interactions, but also from the scientists that I have been able not only to uh, coincide with, to be there, to witness, but also to drive Zodiacs for. And what they are doing is using a drone to take photos from above. It is the most non-invasive way to study these creatures. And they are finding out the most fascinating of things, not only measuring size, width, but also health, reproductive health, uh, malnourishment, various things that, that information that can be used to change a variety of things like fishing quota policy and just establishing more marine protected areas in one of the most pristine landscapes on planet Earth. This is frontline science. This is a way for us to better understand our planet in ways that should be exciting to us because all of these creatures and the lives that they live and the stories that are wrapped up in the decisions that they make and how they have evolved, all of this is a way for the history of our planet and the importance of the science to, to reach us, to reach us in a way that we retain, that we will remember tomorrow that might affect how we speak about our planet and the value of the natural world. I think many of you can understand that I am passion, uh, passionate about this. And the question is, what will I do to get people's attention? Well, it's pretty simple, anything I have to. And sometimes that's comedy, uh, sometimes that's a choice in who I'm interviewing or which creature we're choosing to focus on because the ocean has so many stories. And we need to disarm the conversation so that we're actually able to talk to each other again. Uh, we are living in an age where science is under fire in a way that I would argue hasn't been seen since the days of Galileo because truth is now at stake. And the truth is, is that every part of our planet uh, needs some attention, some focus and some restoration but even as far as Antarctica is, it is still affecting our daily lives because of climate change, because of the krill that is being fished down there and used to feed fish farms across the world. So don't think that Antarctica isn't a part of your life because it is. And to instill this into younger generations, to teach them to inspire wonder has been my mission for the last two years. We have done education tours. Of course, we have an assortment of online media as you've seen in this presentation, but there's nothing quite like looking a kid in the eye and letting them ask you the questions that are on their mind. And let's be honest, about 99% of the world will never go to Antarctica. They just won't. Circumstances, finances, all of this will get in the way. It's far away. It's hard to access. But for the last two years, me and my team have been filming virtual reality down there. You set up a 360 camera, you walk away, penguins are curious. They walk right up to it. And these children get an eye-to-eye -eye encounter. And this is something that has a value that I just don't think can be expressed in words because there is so much to distract us, adult and child alike, in this year 2020 and probably continuing for the future decades. So how do we emphasize, how do we reinvigorate what is actually important so that the decisions that get made to protect these things actually do come to pass? Well, looking people in the eye is one way. And these education tours we have done across the, the West Coast, Washington, Oregon, down into California, we've gone to Texas, 
And even last year, we did a three-week tour in Australia, uh, visiting schools and children's hospitals. And I will tell you that there was a study done that showed that virtual reality reduces anxiety. Reduces anxiety for a child who may be in the hospital for some unspeakable il illness that, that may take their life. But for a moment, they get to go somewhere else. They get to see a penguin. They get to change their sloping body position and roll those shoulders back and lean forward and smile ear to ear because that is what nature gives to us. That is the gift of being alive on planet Earth. And it is only how we frame these things, which is the task at hand. And I assembled quite a team to go on these education tours with me. And primary among them uh, was information designer and marine scientist Sky Murray, an Oregon native and one of the most fascinating minds in marine conservation today. Sky is a dear friend of mine, enough that when she went to Antarctica on her multitude of scientific research uh, journeys, she gave me this fish print of an Antarctic ice fish. Again, an answer, where are all the fish? Most of them are in the deep waters of Antarctica, and most of them have, you know, that antifreeze in their blood. But what a way, what a nuanced way to present Antarctica in a new light. And that is what Sky does. She, she turns the mind towards how we think about Antarctica, because in truth, we don't think about it enough, specifically with that legendary amount of ice that's down there. Often it's represented by a mere smudge at the bottom of a globe or at the bottom of a map, a forgettable representation. But now is not the time to be forgetting. Now is the time to be making ourselves as aware as possible. And to do so, Sky, gave, uh, Sky came to me with a very interesting prospect. She said, I want to represent Antarctica in one image in one data visualization. So what I need from you, Paul, is 50 photographs from under the water there. And she took my 50 photographs from under the water and 50 from above that she took herself and she made this beauty. And what you are seeing won National Science Foundation awards and was published in Popular Science Magazine. And it is called Antarctica, a Chromatic Paradox because what Sky did here was represent in a once-off visualization how much more colorful Antarctica is below the water than it is above. And that is enough of a shocker to just cause pause and say, wait, what is actually happening down there? And that is the beginning of a curious mind. And that is all that we ever try and do. Now, this was in print. Uh, very fanciful, very aesthetically pleasing, but Sky went the extra step and made it interactive. So by a wave of your hand over an infrared sensor, students are now able to explore all 100 of these images. And this has been featured in museums internationally. It has been brought into all of the schools and children's hospitals that we have visited. And it is a way for Antarctica to knock down people's doors and to say, what you expected, or at least what you thought of this place, we are here to challenge. We are here to challenge you to care about it. We are here to care about, we are here to challenge you to care about yourself because Antarctica is directly connected to the health of our planet and to show you some of the passion and how we rolled out our education tours. Uh, I would like to share a short video with you now to example what we did. On this tour, we're connecting these students to faraway places using new and immersive technologies, uh, like these virtual reality headsets. And it, it's really interesting to go into these schools and hospitals and see children put on these headsets and all of a sudden their face lights up. It's, it's a whole body smile as suddenly they're face to face with all of these penguins. All of these penguins, look at them. They're everywhere. Another interactive pieces we're bringing to these students is a gestural data-driven art piece called Antarctica, a Chromatic Paradox. It is a piece I created that exposes our assumptions of a colorless Antarctica, uh, revealing a surprising realm below, a colorful world of sea creatures, 
plant life uh, that really shows off the abundance and diversity of the Antarctic ecosystem. It's really amazing to see students interacting with this piece because it feels very magical uh, as they wave their hand over this infrared sensor that's kind of mapping where their hand is in space. They're able to explore this ecosystem with a wave of their hand. We're excited about what has happened here and we want to bring this style of education to the world. So there is how we went about teaching people about Antarctica in new and dynamic ways. I think this is important. I think the language on how we speak about our planet needs to change, specifically about these far off places that, like we have said over and over again, are far outside of our imagination and consideration. Because of this, Meet the Ocean, our nonprofit here in Portland, is on the council of the Antarctic Southern Ocean Coalition. These are, uh, this is an organization, I should say, that is set up to defend the Southern Ocean as a whole. Because though Antarctica has been set aside in a treaty as a place for peace and for science, that is essentially about the land itself. And many countries are looking at the ocean the marine living resources specifically as something that can be extracted. And when you're taking food out of the Southern Ocean, when you're removing krill from those waters, you are essentially and bare bones stealing food out of the mouth of penguins. And I just don't think that that's acceptable. So to be on this council, to be a defender of Antarctica is truly something that I am proud of. And I will say in the effort for the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area, the current largest marine protected area on our planet, Meet the Ocean had a small role to play. Uh, we were asked by the Antarctic Southern Ocean Coalition to make a video because there's not a lot of people diving down in Antarctica and they thought that our footage would have value. So we made an English version and we made a Spanish version and in the 11th hour of the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area vote, uh, these videos were shown. And I'm happy to say that, as we know, the result was positive. But this is the only marine protected area in Antarctica. And the peninsula, the place that I am most familiar with, and the place that the most fishing happens, and the most tourism happens, is not currently set up as a marine protected area. And even as heralded and as triumphant as the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area is, it has something that's known as a sunset clause. I believe that before the year 2040, that marine protected area will be reevaluated and could potentially dissolve. What does this teach us? This teaches us that the fight is ever present, that there will always be forces that are trying to extract and benefit financially from and because of that, there will always be a need for education, for engagement, and for new strategies, for emerging technology, and for the right framing to value these places, regardless of the demographic, be they young or old, we all live on this planet, and Antarctica is one of the most special places on it. If you want to learn more about it, we have several podcasts that feature Antarctica. That entire killer whale wave wash episode that I was just uh, exampling is our latest podcast. And this is a way for us to take you there. We take you there with the soundscapes so that when the killer whales are swimming, when the people are crying out in either awe or encouragement of the creature, or if we are speaking about the keystone species. Think about that term, keystone, something that potentially can unlock the entirety of the Antarctic marine food web. Its importance cannot be understated. And we cannot rely on simply the best science available. We need to be more proactive so that we are not suddenly caught off guard by having extracted too many resources from this place. We must defend it now 
in the hour where it is still able to be done. And to do that, we need to collect the voices. This is why I seek out the experts, the advocates, those who are passionate about these ocean ecosystems, and why I put a microphone on them and I say, tell me a story. Because that story will then reach the public around the world and maybe some good can be done. This is who I am. This is what I do. That camera was given to us via a grant. Uh, and since then, I have taken it around the world and will continue to do so. In this time of COVID, I think virtual uh, interaction is at an all-time high and certainly more precious than it has ever been before. So again, I certainly thank OMSI for giving me this platform with which to speak about this far-off place, this white continent that is growing ever more important to us by the day. If you want to help us out, you can subscribe to our podcast or perhaps donate to our nonprofit so that we can keep pushing these stories out to the people interacting with the public, and creating meaningful change. So I thank you for listening, for all of you who are around the world. And uh, I guess now it's time for a question and answer session. Hello, thank you so much. Um, that was an incredible lecture. Your visuals and the videos, those are really amazing. Just felt so immersive. Thank you. Uh, are you ready for some questions from the audience? I'm ready. Whew. Okay. Um, this first question is about sort of your career path. Um, you said you majored in creative writing. For somebody else who's interested in going into science communication, kind of how you are, would you recommend they go more creative writing or do you wish you had taken more science classes or like having done that in sort of a, a non typical fashion, do you have anything to sort of share about what people should maybe study in school? Uh, I wish I took all the science classes. Uh, I wish I had three lives to live to take them all. Um, it just, it wasn't, it wasn't who I was at the time. I was more interested in how a story gets told. And I think regardless of the medium, if you are in finance, if you are in anything, but science specifically, the, the ability to tell that story is, is more precious than ever because when we think about how science gets digested, it's often a headline. And maybe you read the article, maybe you don't, but that article is often a summary of the scientist's information. So already at that point, it's being pushed through so many lenses that perhaps the, the, the point of it all is getting diluted somewhat. So science communication is, is aided by good storytelling. So if you are in science and you are passionate about getting that message out, any sort of narrative interaction is gonna be to your benefit. Awesome, thanks. I know we always have a lot of uh, younger folks watching these and so they're always interested about what to do with their schooling and careers. This is a great inspiration. Um, okay, our next question is wondering, in that whole big food web that you were speaking about, um, what eats the kelp? Is there an animal that sort of specializes with eating kelp? Yeah, uh, the limpet, I would say, is a specialist, just because there's so many of them. Um, there's, there's, there's basically not a dive in Antarctica where I don't see a limpet. So at least I know I got that, you know. Uh, there are there are other uh, snail species that will eat at the kelp, and uh, but mostly it's it's your mollusks that are sort of there, and they're using the radula to sort of scrape it off, and they're they're eating the larger kelp species, but they're also scraping the microalgae off the rocks themselves. Awesome. Um, ooh, this is sort of a, should I say, a psychology question. <laughs> Lay it on uh, me. What does it mean that we anthropomorphize puppies and baby seals and that kind of thing and, and our feelings of right and wrong and why we end up rooting for babies and not predators? Um, good question. What? I will say that during that wave washing seal event, 
there was a definitive line between who was rooting for the killer whales and who was rooting for the seal. And, and it did change throughout the interaction. Like some people uh. switched sides. Um, I think evolutionarily speaking, we, we are attracted to large eyes, right? So if there's a puppy, big eyes, if there's a seal, big eyes, and uh, something in our, in our internal brain structure probably delivers some sort of positive associated with that. So regardless of the species, we always want the young to survive, um, which is always, that's a message of hope, whereas a predator is like the end of the road. So I, I think psychologically speaking, to root for the young is to root for a continuation of life. Whereas rooting for the predator, you're just maybe hoping for a good photo of carnage. I, I don't know. That's a great take on it. Yeah, I see it. Um, okay, next one. Could you share with us your vision of how we could experience Antarctica virtually in five years or 10 years? Like, how do you think this sort of VR technology will evolve? And they're wondering, and this is a word I'm not sure I've, I haven't heard of. Could it involve haptics, which they say is touch? I do you know what that is? Um, I, I'm no expert on haptics, but when dealing with the polar regions and how you know, what topical they are uh, because of temperature change on our planet. I think more and more we, we need to have those type of interactive experiences. And um, I know that Meet the Ocean is, we're, we're flipping our website, uh, redesigning it, I should say, and, and soon Antarctic virtual reality will be available for people there. Um, but virtual reality itself is still semi-new. And I would say geared more towards the video game sphere where I'm very interested in studying the emotional impact and, and therapy that could be involved in nature interactions using VR. Because like I said, with our hospital outreach, we, we've had some uh, interactions with that doctor saying how there's a great change. And when you're specifically trying to inform people about an ecosystem, I think the more tactile it is, the more experiential, uh, the better the results. But I guess uh, I don't outrightly know, but I'm sure there's plenty of people making things, especially currently, we don't know if the Antarctic season is happening. If that's true, if, if COVID takes that away from us, then how to bring people to Antarctica when they can't go is going to become a primary question. Yeah. So I guess, are you saying that you think virtual battle will become, be used more for researchers and not just for um, lay folk trying to experience it if we don't have a research season there? Um, I, I, necessity is the mother of invention, right? So I don't know what form it will take. I don't know if VR besides animal behavior would be particularly useful for science. Uh, I think it's more for the experience of the individual wearing the, the headset. Okay. Um, let's see. So you kind of mentioned this struggle with corporations and this trend of sort of making money and exploiting Antarctica in these spaces. Is there anything like, do you have steps you would recommend for people who want to have some, like be active against those kinds of trends, like ways they can become activists in that way? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> when fish, uh, when krill are fish in the Southern ocean, uh, the question is where does that, product go. About 80% of it ends up feeding farm fish, normally salmon, perhaps tilapia, but it's definitely going to farm fish. So uh, we can have a whole nother talk about farm fish versus wild fish. But generally, uh, when you think about resource extraction, you're taking a protein source from Antarctica and putting into fish farms. So 
eventually that's going to have an effect on Antarctica proper. But in terms of actionable things that you as an individual can do, if you are a big fan of omega-3, then you may have heard that krill are, are rich in them. And it's totally true. Um, the thing is, is that you don't need to eat a living animal. You don't need an animal to get omega-3s. All omega-3s on our planet come from algae. So you can get an omega-3 pill that's sourced directly from algae. And I think that is a great workaround because, you know, a lot of people like omega-3s. Uh, people say it helps the brain or it helps the joints. Uh, whatever the reason that you take these supplements, and there are plenty of reasons to, you can choose to cut krill out of the equation entirely uh, by sourcing it from, from algae itself, which I think not enough people know about because the, the marketing behind omega-3 is that krill is better than fish. And I think that that's true because fish have an amount of bioaccumulation in them. So traces of mercury and other this, that, and the other thing, krill won't have any of that because they're just eating directly uh, algae. But why not cut the creature out of the equation if you can gain the omega-3 from the algae itself? Yeah, those are some great recommendations. Thank you. Um, let's see. Ooh, <laughs> an experiential question. Actually, we have a couple experiential qu like questions about your experience. How do you dive in such cold water and still use a camera? <laughs> um, there are mechanisms within our bodies that let us know when things are wrong. Uh, those mechanisms engage the moment you roll off the boat and fall into Antarctic water. Uh, your body is telling you you're not supposed to be there. So certainly there is a lot of psychological warfare going on. Like I'm only going to stay until my lips go numb. Well, that happens after 10 minutes. I'm only going to stay until I can't feel my fingers anymore. All right. Well, that's 30 minutes and wait, something cool just swam by. I need to take a photo of it, but it's 45 minutes and you're shivering. And if you're shivering, then that's dangerous. So uh, it is a ticking clock the moment you get in the water. I do wear a dry suit. So theoretically, I'm dry underneath the suit and I have several layers of uh, wool because wool keeps the body warm even when it's wet, just in case it gets wet. And then I wear dry gloves, which in terms of dexterity, I, I could not knit underwater with dry gloves and I can barely operate a camera, but you do your best. Uh, you can see my gloves on screen. I don't know if that is still up, uh, but very cumbersome. And the buttons on your camera are quite small. So you, you have to sort of become so familiar with your equipment that you're not even thinking about it anymore. You're just, you're, you're doing it. Um, our next experiential question is, uh, have you stayed over the winter in Antarctica? And if so, can you comment on your experience? I have not. Uh, Many of my friends have. I have friends who study Weddell Seals. I, there's a great project called the Ice Spin Robot. Um, most of that is based out of McMurdo Station. So no, uh, I'm only there during what's known as uh, the Antarctic summer. So basically November through March is the time I'm there. Uh, I've never overwintered though there, you know, you, you mentioned during the, uh, the trivia that you know, plumbers are needed and basically any job is available down there. Uh, but there's also some like great ones like uh, for creative writers or, or really anything. If, if you want to go to Antarctica, there are ways. Um, you might have to spend the winter over there. And I would recommend bringing a sense of humor and a couple of good books. That's awesome. Um. Oh, our last question is a great summary. And you have mentioned this a little bit, but maybe you can kind of distill it down. Uh, what's your number one action recommendation for helping the ocean that the folks watching can do? Only one. <laughs> now, um, <laughs> when, uh, when, when people ask me if you could do one thing to help the ocean, um, my, 
now this is not something that an individual could do, but like theoretically, I would like trawling to stop because mm -hmm. trawling is, a, you might know it as bottom dragging, but in order to capture whatever species you're after, you end up destroying habitat. And when you destroy habitat, you cut off the lifeline of the creatures that would grow there. For the individual, uh, it becomes a, a, a daily battle. Um, if anyone that knows their Greek mythology, you might have heard of Sisyphus pushing a rock up the hill. And then at the end of the day, it rolls on back down. So tomorrow, Sisyphus has to push that rock up the hill again. And that is an apt metaphor for how we live our lives. Because when you decide what you're going to purchase, be it uh, something wrapped in plastic versus something with less plastic or not at all, or... Uh, where you're sourcing your seafood from, or how you're voting. All of these things uh, in small increments can cause big change. We do live in a democracy after all, and when the people speak up, uh, they will get heard. And I think we are reaching something that's inevitable, which is just coming to terms with, there are things we need to change, uh, you know, without going too deep into all of that unpacks. Uh, there are some realities about how we have been living, uh, and most of it is a strive towards ease and convenience, and who lives more comfortable than most of the, let's call it the first world right now, but there comes a price, and something in nature that doesn't serve the system, doesn't serve the ecosystem, but harms it, can't last. So we as a species need to reconsider the way in which we live on this planet so that we can continue to. That is a, a very dramatic summary of that question. That was perfect, actually. That was very inspiring. Thank you so much for coming and doing this talk and for just sharing your passion with all of us. Uh, you guys are welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in. Plenty of Antarctic podcasts and, of course, more upcoming science pubs so so do turn in thanks for being here yeah uh okay folks we are out of time i hope you enjoyed tonight's event if you would like to watch this video again or if you want to share it with your friends and family you can check out the video section on omsi's facebook page or our youtube channel and don't forget to follow us on facebook instagram and twitter for updates on future events and inspiring content from omsi and I mentioned at the beginning, but please consider supporting Science Pub and making a donation via the Facebook donate button, or you can visit omsi.edu slash donate. Join us next Monday, August 3rd, for a lecture on Oregon's response to COVID-19 with Dr. Dr. David Bangsberg from OHSU. He will talk about what we did, where we are, how the key to Oregon initiative is helping prevent the second wave and what the future holds. Please note this event is on a Monday instead of our usual Tuesday. Once again, thanks to our partner Stellastream for making tonight's event possible. And as always, you can get more information on our website at omzi.edu. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful night.